So this video right here is going to be about electrical switches, pressure switches, temperature switches, timer switches, all of that. Um, I'll start out with the basics. And before I get into that, I do want to point out that different manufacturers will draw switches and different symbols slightly differently. So in other words, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's no universal or standard way to draw a single symbol. There's probably at least three different ways to draw it. So the switches that I'll be drawing are not exclusive, meaning this is not the only way to draw it and there's no other way. I'm sure there probably is a different way. But the ones I'll be drawing are just the ones that are more common. You're probably going to see a lot of them in wiring diagrams that you'll look at. So let's begin with just the basic switches. And one more thing I want to point out, if you look at a wiring diagram, everything that you see on there is wired or basically shown with the unit powered off. So this right here is a basic symbol for a switch and there can be many different kinds of switches. This right here, this particular symbol is a normally open or basically NO. A normally open switch. And to be more technical about it, this is a single pole, single throw. So it has one pole and it only goes one direction. And if you ever see that, this is what that would look like. So single pole, single throw, SPST, normally open switch. And this switch right here is a NC or a normally closed switch. So with the power off to the unit or in normal operating conditions with the power off, this switch would be closed normally. And once again, it's a SPST, single pole, single throw. So for example, this open switch right here, this could be like a light switch. If your lights are off, the switch would be open. Or like on a furnace power switch, if you flip that switch off, this is what that would look like. And this switch right over here, that's in the normally closed position, an example of that would be the interlock or the door switch on a furnace. This is a normally closed switch. But if you pull the furnace door off, that switch opens up. And the next switch we have right here is a double pole, so DP single throw. Now the reason it's a single throw is because the dashed lines right here, they signify that these two are connected. So when you switch one off, the other one goes right with it. So an example of this would be like a two pole circuit breaker. You know, the bigger ones where the two of them are connected. Of course, if you turn one of them off, the other one gets turned off as well. And another common switch that you may see is the two way switch, which is this guy right here. So once again, this one will be, if we're being technical about it, this will be a single pole, single pole, double throw. So it can go into two positions. So DP. So this switch right here has two positions. It'll either send power down this wire or it'll send power down this wire. So the switch can be switched up or down or however the switch looks like to send power to one of these directions. And there is some variations to this. These are just the basics that you're probably going to see the most often, but you could see some variations of this on some wiring diagrams as well. For example, you can have a double pole, double throw, where it's not connected like that. Or you can have even a triple pole, so there's going to be three of them in a row. You can see different variations of this stuff, but most commonly, these are the basic ones you'll see all the time. So let's move on to some of the more interesting switches. Erase that. Okay, so let's move on to our next set of switches. And the first one we have right here is simply a push button switch. So literally this would be the symbol for a push button switch. So push to start, either you push it in and it stays in or it only engages while you have it pushed in. Either way, this will be the symbol for a push button switch. This is a normally open switch. This is a normally closed switch. And sometimes they'll be drawn with the actual button on top of them. It'll look something like that. But like I said, there's always more than one way of drawing them. Typically, they will look like that. The next two switches we have here are pressure switches. So whenever you see a switch with a little plunger looking thing on the bottom of it, that is a pressure switch. And those can be used in air conditioners or furnaces or washers or other appliances. These pressure switches, they basically either close on a rise of pressure or they open on a rise of pressure. So this one right here is a normally closed pressure switch. This one is a normally open pressure switch. And actually, let's go ahead and write that down. 
So this one opens on rise in pressure. And this one right here closes on rise in pressure. And of course, both of them, you could rephrase the words differently, but essentially this is what they will mean. This one opens on rise in pressure. This one closes on rise in pressure. So an example of this, a normally open pressure switch would be in a furnace. So the inducer motor turns on, and in order to prove that there's a draft, that it's venting properly, this normally open pressure switch, the air pressure will close it and allow the power to go through. This one, for example, would be a high pressure switch. So like an air conditioner. So if the air conditioner pressures, the refrigerant pressures get too high, this pressure switch would sense the increase in pressure and open up and interrupt power turning off the unit. So let's go ahead and write that down as well. So this one would be an HPS for high pressure switch and low pressure switch right here. This is for air conditioning. So this one can be written either as an LPS or LPC, low pressure cutoff. But on most air conditioning wiring diagrams, the good thing about those is that most of the time these will be labeled anyways. They're gonna say, you know, HPS right on top of it or LPC. As for furnaces though, like I was saying, furnaces are always gonna have this pressure switch right here, which is normally open. And moving on to our next two switches, we have thermostat switches or basically heat switches. This one right here opens if the temperature gets hotter. So there's a sensor, or usually it's a bimetal or a snap disc. Um, if that thing heats up enough, it'll open up and interrupt the circuit. So this switch right here is normally closed, but if it gets hotter than it's supposed to, this switch will open up and interrupt power. Whereas this one right here, if the temperatures go up, the switch closes and allows power to go through. So normally closed, normally open. And just like the pressure switches, this one would open on rise in temp, whereas this one would close on rise in temp. And two examples of this would be for example, either a flame rollout switch or a high limit switch on a furnace. So this is a normally closed switch on a furnace, let's say the high limit, it's a normally closed switch. But if for some reason, let's say the filter hasn't been replaced for ages, the furnace starts to overheat, it gets too hot, the temperature goes up higher than it should, whatever the rating is, like 160, 170, that goes up and interrupts the circuit if the furnace is getting too hot. And actually, let's write that down. So this would be the high limit, for example. And you know what? Let's write this down too. This is a push button. Since I already have a bunch of words on here, might as well label it all. Push button switch. So this would be a high limit or a flame rollout. And of course, these temperature switches, the best example is in a thermostat, right? So if we think about it, in a thermostat, which one of these would be W for heat and which one of these would be Y for cooling? So let's say this is R right here on the thermostat. This is power coming in to the thermostat, right? From the control board in the furnace. So it's getting 24 volts, the thermostat is. And this switch right here would be used for cooling. And let me explain why. Why, right? So this switch if it gets hotter in the house, this temperature switch starts to go up until it makes a connection. Boom, it sends power to the air conditioner through Y. And once it cools off enough, the temperature in the house or around the thermostat starts to drop again. So that switch opens back up, interrupts power and turns the air conditioner off. Similarly, in the winter, when your furnace is running, this would be W. When your furnace is running, this is closed. If the temperature in the house is getting hotter, the thermostat senses that temperature and this switch goes up and opens up, interrupting the circuit and turning off the furnace. And since we're talking about the thermostat, we got the heating, we got the cooling. If we look at the fan switch on most basic digital thermostats, you got the fan switch, right? 
So let's call this fan. This would be a two position switch like we saw in the previous uh, whiteboard drawing. This one would be usually on or auto. Sometimes they're in the different, they're on different sides. So on most thermostats, this would be a two position switch. The switch is either in the auto position or the on position. So let's just draw that switch one more time. There's the connections. Here's our switch, right? So if you set it to auto, it's in this circuit. If you set it to on, the switch goes to this circuit. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, and I think that's all I had to say about these switches. Let's erase all of these guys and go on to the next set. Okay, so here is our last set of electrical switches. Let's start with the first two up on top here. The one on top is a float switch. Float switch. And the one below it is similar, but it's a little bit different. This one is a flow switch. So let's start with the float switch up on top. A good example of one of those would be a condensate drain pump on a furnace or maybe for an air conditioner. If the unit does not have a floor drain anywhere nearby, a lot of times a condensate drain pump will be installed to pump out the water to a different location in another room or like a laundry tub. So one of those things would have a float switch in them. What happens is it has a pan or a collection tank. Water or condensate collects in there and as the level gets higher and higher, this float switch starts to go up. And when it goes up high enough, it closes and allows power to go through. That turns on the drain pump and it pumps all that water out of that little reservoir tank. And most of these switches are gonna be in a normally open position. The float switches, actually the flow switch will also be in a normally open position in most circumstances. The flow switch is also to monitor water or gas or steam or anything that has velocity going through a space, a pipe or a duct. The flow switch is basically a normally open switch that closes if there's flow or if flow comes through. A good example of this would be like the sprinkler systems in a commercial building. If the sprinkler system opens and water starts to come out, this flow switch, which is normally open, because of that flow of water, it'll close and send an alarm to the fire detection system after that circuit is closed. So that's how a flow switch would work. As for this guy right here, this is a rotary switch. So this symbol right here, if you ever see that on a wiring diagram, that means there's a rotary switch there. So instead of an on off switch, like a regular light switch type of style or a button, you're gonna have a switch that you can rotate. So that's all that means. And typically it'll have some kind of connections going to it on the wiring diagram. This guy right here is a humidistat or a humidity control. And this symbol is basically just a normal switch with a little box under it. And of course, the application for this would be in a either a dehumidifier or a humidifier. It would be in the humidistat. When the humidity level goes down, the circuit closes and turns on the humidifier to bring the humidity back up. This one right here is a timer, a timer switch. So whenever you see a line with like a triangle without the bottom piece there, that stands for a timer switch. And most of the time, timer switches like this can be found in time delay boards. A lot of times you'll find them in the control board in a condenser unit outside. It delays it by about five minutes before it starts. And once again, this is a timer. So as the minutes go by, this little switch starts to go down, down, down until it clicks and lets the power through and the unit turns on. So if you ever see a little symbol like this, that just means it's a timer switch. And I'm going to go ahead and write that down. Almost all the time, a switch like that will be found in a time delay, time delay 
control board. So if you see this thing on a wiring diagram, most likely that means there's going to be a time delay control board in there. Well guys, and that is all the electrical switches I had to show you. I hope you found this list useful. And like I was saying in the beginning of the video, this is by all means not an exhaustive list of electrical switches. There are tons of electrical symbols and many different kind of electrical symbols for switches. So what I showed you are just some of the more common ones, but definitely not all of them and even some of these can be drawn differently. But anyway, I hope this video was useful for you. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to mash that like button on the way out and we'll see you next time. And if you're still here and not in the comment section below, let me tell you a little proverb that I heard recently that taught me a little lesson. So in the ancient times, there was this one king that had a dream. So he had a dream where all his teeth fall out all except one. So he woke up the next morning, really troubled. He was worried about this dream. He's thinking to himself, man, there's no way this is just a regular dream. So he calls a seer over, one of these wise men that can, you know, tell you about visions and dreams and what they mean and stuff like that. And he asks him, hey, I had this dream. Do you know what this means? And that wise man bluntly tells him, king, that means that everybody in your family will die. Everybody except you. The king was really angry to hear these news, especially since he put it so bluntly. He got angry and just sent that guy to prison. But that did not ease his worry. So he calls another wise man, tells him the same story, tells him, hey, tell me what this dream means. The second wise man was a lot smarter than the first, and he tells him, oh king, you are so great. Your life force is so amazing that you will literally outlive everybody in your family. This time, the king was very pleased he tells this guy, good job, gives him a reward, and sends him on his way. So what I learned from this is there's always more than one way of saying something. For example, if my wife makes a dish that does not taste very good at all, I can either tell her, honey, this is terrible. What'd you put in here? Or I can say something more creative like, sweetie, this dish is pretty good, but it's definitely not in the top five best dishes that you've ever made. So hopefully this little story will inspire us to say the truth a little more tactfully instead of just bluntly pushing it into somebody's face. I know my example might have not been the greatest, but if you have a better example of two ways of saying the same thing, please let us know in the comments below. I'll see you there.